Hello, this is True Crime Nightmare. This is episode 33 of this podcast. This is the case of the murder of a woman called Linda Cook. Linda Cook was murdered on the 9th of December of 1986 in Portsmouth, which is in England. Linda was 24 years old at the time of her murder. She had worked as a barmaid at a local pub in the local area. Linda Cook lived with a lady called Linda Gray. Linda Gray was actually the mother of Linda Cook's new boyfriend. Unfortunately, Linda's new boyfriend was incarcerated in a detention centre at the time. Linda Cook had only moved into the house just about a month before her murder. Late in the evening of the 8th of December in 1986, after spending most of the day at home, Linda Cook decided to walk a short distance to a friend's house. It was about 11.30 at night by this point. Linda had gone to a house nearby in the local area near to where she lived. She'd only spent a short time at her friend's house before she decided to walk the short distance home again. It was now just after midnight when she left the friend's house. Linda Cook did not make it home. She was attacked on the way home. Linda had been walking across some wasteland where she came across her attacker. It was now about 1230 p.m. or one o'clock in the morning of the 9th of December of 1986. The wasteland that Linda Cook had been walking across was known by the locals as Merry Row, so called Merry Row was next to Lake Road in in Portsmouth. Linda Cook was attacked as she walked along the familiar route to her. Linda's attacker was either following her or he just happened to to be there at the same time as her. Linda Cook was brutally attacked. She was raped and murdered. The killer strangled her to death. There was evidence of an extremely vicious attack. The poor woman had been stamped on several times, which had resulted in very severe injuries to her head and also to her body. The killer had left an imprint of his shoe on Linda's abdomen, which just goes to show how much force must have been used. The pathologist who examined Linda's body later reported that he felt that the attack had probably lasted at least 15 minutes due to all of the injuries that were inflicted. Linda Cook had been naked when she was discovered, which was later the same day. Many swabs were taken from her body as well as other items of potential evidence which were taken from the crime scene itself. The killer's blood group was quickly identified due to some of the evidence that had been left at the scene. Some fibres had had also been discovered under Linda Cook's fingernails. Evidence was definitely mounting in the hunt to find out just who was responsible for this dreadful murder. Linda Cook's underwear was also discovered nearby. A person of interest was soon identified. This was in the form of a man called Michael Shirley. Michael was only 18 years old at the time and was serving in the Royal Navy. He was stationed on HMS Apollo. HMS Apollo was, at the time of Linda Cook's murder, docked at Portsmouth. Portsmouth is in the southeast of England and serves as a naval base for the UK Navy. It was established that on the night of Linda Cook's attack, Michael Shirley had attended a local nightclub. The nightclub was called Joanna's. That particular night, Michael Shirley had met a local woman called Dina Fogg for the first time whilst at the club. They had apparently arranged to spend the night together. Michael and Dina had shared a taxi back to the tower block where Dina had a flat. 
Dina later reported that she changed her mind about staying with Michael and had made an excuse to leave. She had told him that she wanted to go home first to collect her small child and then she would come back to the taxi. She later told the police that she had no intentions of going back and had just made an excuse to get away from him for some reason. It is not clear what the issue really was. But anyway, Dina had decided to leave and rather than just be upfront about why she had made some excuse up, maybe she felt that Michael would be upset or cause a scene. Who knows? After a short while, Michael Shirley realised she was not coming back and he paid off the taxi and went to look for Dina on foot. He later told the police that once he realised he was not likely to find Dina, he decided to give up and instead go back to his ship. Michael Shirley met up again with Dina Fogg at the same nightclub that they had recently met up before. They both apparently discussed Linda Cook's murder and and stated how close they had been to where she was eventually discovered. For some reason, Dina had found Michael Shirley intimidating had, and had later reported some concerns about him to the Hampshire police. Portsmouth is in the county of Hampshire, so that's why it was the Hampshire police that were investigating Linda Cook's murder. Michael Shirley was on shore leave over the upcoming Christmas holidays and spent it at his parents' house in Leamington Spa, which is in Warwickshire. Warwickshire is about 130 miles away from Portsmouth. He returned to Portsmouth in early January of 1987. His shore leave was coming to an end and he was shortly due to set sail on HMS Apollo to the Falkland Islands. The Falkland Islands are a British territory located many miles from the UK. They are located in the southwest Atlantic Ocean. Once Michael Shirley returned to Portsmouth and just before he was about to rejoin his crew on HMS Apollo, Michael Shirley was arrested in connection with the rape and murder of Linda Cook. He was remanded in custody as well. Shortly after he was arrested, Michael Shirley was in fact charged with the rape and murder of Linda Cook. He was once again remanded in custody until his trial. He was obviously unable to depart for the Falkland Islands at all. The evidence against him appeared to be circumstantial. Evidence presented at his subsequent murder trial included the imprint that was left on Linda's body from her attacker's shoe. Also, the prosecution would present more circumstantial evidence, which included some scratches that Michael had sustained. It was reported that he had various scratches on his face and body, but at the time that he was questioned by the police in relation to Linda's murder, the scratches were quite old and had almost disappeared. A doctor was brought in to look at the scratches and he tried to date them but he could not reliably do so. Also the defence showed that Linda's fingernails had not been broken at, at all so it was considered unlikely that she had caused the scratches while trying to defend herself. This was before DNA testing was in widespread use as well so the evidence under her nails could not be used. The prosecution would also go on to claim that the information given by Michael Shirley regarding him getting out of the taxi and going on foot to try and find Dina Fogg was really just him trying to provide some sort of alibi to the police later on so that his movements could be accounted for to some degree. Obviously, the suggestion was being that he wasn't looking for Dina at all, but had in fact come across Linda Cook and had attacked and then murdered her. The prosecution put forward the case that Michael Shirley had been angry at the way he had been treated by one woman, so he took his revenge out on another woman instead, namely Linda Cook. The blood group of Linda Cook's attacker was identified as being O-positive, which 
was the same blood group as Michael Shirley. O positive is a very common blood group and up to 23% of people had that particular blood group, the O positive blood group in the UK at that time by all accounts. So the prosecution basically were putting a few points forward to try and convict Michael Shirley of Linda Cook's murder. The shoe prints they, they put forward because it had the word flash written on the bottom because they could see by the imprint that was left on her abdomen. And it was the same type of trainer that Michael Shirley was known to wear. But, they, you know, again, they were quite common as well. And also the so-called missing half hour where he said he was going looking for the lady from the nightclub. But the, obviously the prosecution is saying that he may have started out doing that, but in fact he came across Linda Cook by chance and that he was basically angry and frustrated and took his revenge out on her. Also the evidence of the um, blood group, which as I've said is fairly common blood group, but obviously DNA wasn't really possible at this point to sort of narrow it down any more than that. The defence put forward some arguments, as you can imagine, they also looked at, you know, some of the suggestions and, and pointed out the weaknesses in the prosecution's account of what they had presented to the jury. The defence apparently thought that the case against their client, Michael Shirley, was quite weak. However, the jury did not agree with the defence and found Michael Shirley guilty of the rape and the murder of Linda Cook. An appeal was made, but it was denied. Michael Shirley had been convicted on the 28th of January of 1988 by a majority of 11 to 1. He was given a life sentence by the judge, Mr Justice Hutchinson. The trial had taken place at Winchester Crown Court. Michael Shirley was sent to start his prison sentence at Aylesbury Prison, which is in Kent in England. Michael Shirley has always, right from the very beginning, He's always denied having any involvement in Linda Cook's murder and he continued to deny it even after he'd been put away for life. In 1992, he went on a hunger strike for five weeks to try and convince the media and the public that he was an innocent man. At a later stage during his sentence, Michael Shirley carried out a rooftop protest on the roof of the prison he was being held at. I'm unsure how he managed to get on the roof, but certainly prisoners in the past in the UK have somehow managed to do this, but not so much these days. Maybe they have tightened up now, and because it, it does not seem to happen now. A journalist named Neil Humber started to take an interest in Michael Shirley shortly after this latest protest. Neil Humber quickly became convinced that Michael Shirley was innocent of the murderous attack on Linda Cook. He set about trying to get more publicity for Michael's case. He wanted to try to convince the higher powers that be that the case needed to be looked at again. He soon discovered that a witness in Michael's case, namely Dina Fogg, had given two statements and that there were some discrepancies between them. The problem seemed to stem from the timeline that was given in one of the statements. However, not much happened with Michael Shirley's case at this point, though. In January of 1993, Michael Shirley went on another hunger strike at his prison to once again try and convince the authorities to look at his case again. He apparently told his mother that until he had been assured that the relevant authorities were going to relook at his case, he would stay on hunger strike. He ended up staying on hunger strike for 42 days until the Home Office agreed to look into his case. Neil Humber, the journalist who had undertaken trying to get some justice for Michael Shirley, prepared a 49-page report on the case. The report was passed to the relevant people to be looked at further. Neil Humber, who was working for a newspaper at the time, was sacked from the job. He had apparently been warned by his bosses that if he did not attend a 
work-related course that he was meant to attend and instead worked on the report for Michael Shirley, he would lose his job. He obviously felt very strongly about Michael's innocence. He obviously wanted to try and get justice as well for Michael. However, as is often the case, many setbacks happened along the way. There had been a spate of sex attacks in the area prior to Linda's, Linda Cook's rape and murder. No one had been charged with the attacks and they remain unsolved to this day. So obviously there were bad things happening in the local area in Portsmouth and the police were probably under some pressure to, to sort out what was going on in the area as well. Also, it was felt by looking at Linda Cook's case again, perhaps with the advances in DNA and the fact that they still had some samples or at least one sample to look at that that could be tested or even retested. It was worth looking into Michael Shirley's case again. There appeared to be some discrepancies in some of the evidence that had been presented at Michael Shirley's trial as well. The woman that Michael had spent some time with on the night of Linda Cook's murder had made two statements regarding the timeline, but the statements varied. So really there was no guarantee that the times were accurate at all. The taxi driver that had taken the couple from the nightclub um, to a nearby tower block where Dina Fogg lived. Had just He had picked them up just outside the nightclub in the, in the taxi rank, but the times couldn't really be confirmed. He had a couple of jobs that he'd had booked prior, but um, he couldn't remember exactly what time he'd picked up Michael Shirley and, and Dina Fogg because... He he was busy. It's a you know busy ta busy city, Portsmouth, and that time of night as well would have been particularly busy with everybody coming out of nightclubs and other other parties maybe going on in the area. So you can understand why he couldn't actually pinpoint the exact time. He could remember going to the flats, but he couldn't. He just couldn't remember the exact times. He could only remember the times for the actual bookings that he'd had that night, but the, Michael Shirley and Dina Fogg hadn't really pre-booked the taxi, so they couldn't really confirm that. So during the subsequent appeal, and by the way, there is a full report online in regards to the, all of the findings in this particular case, and it explains just how Michael Shirley was eventually released from his life sentence. It's a very lengthy report and it goes into a lot of detail, a lot of things. So if you want to read that, it's quite easy to look up in if you just um, have a look at Michael Shirley's appeal. The DNA advancement made it obvious that he was not the person who had actually raped and murdered Linda Cook. After all, the DNA profile did not match anyone else on the database either. Hopefully in the near future the real murderer will be caught so that at least Linda Cook's family and friends will finally get some justice. Also the person needs to be put away and kept off the streets. But at least it was proven that the DNA, they had a sl one slide left that they looked at and um, it did not relate to Michael Shirley at all, not even a partial match or anything. It was just completely not not him at all. So they they just dismissed that. So the DNA evidence really, really helped to sort of release him from his, his um, life sentence, really. As I've said before, the police knew at the time of Linda Cook's murder that there was a serial sex offender on the loose in the local area. This attacker has not been identified yet either and there's no nowhere reported that the DNA sample matches any sample from the um, sex attacker either. So I'm not sure what's happening with that. Some people have said that the reason the police had wanted to get someone identified quickly in Linda Cook's case was due to ongoing pressure because of the unsolved sex attacks in the area, which 
you can understand the pressure, but you shouldn't put the wrong person in prison. Who knows if that was the case, and in some ways you, you cannot blame, like I said, you cannot blame the police, especially if they really believed, which they had seemed to, that in fact Michael Shirley was in fact the person responsible. After all, he was convicted by a majority jury of 11 to 1, so obviously the jury felt that he was guilty apart from one person who didn't. DNA was only just being used and was nowhere near as good as it is now, so that was another stumbling block at the time in Linda Cook's case. Michael Shirley was exonerated finally in 2003 after serving 16 years in prison. He was 34 years old at the time of his release. Lots of evidence had been looked at again, including discrepancies in statements from a potential witness, but without the DNA evidence it would probably have been extremely difficult to overturn Michael Shirley's conviction. Linda Cook's family have to continue to live with all of the consequences of that night back in the late 1980s. No one else has been convicted of her vicious murder either, which must just add to their nightmares, I would imagine. Not much is known about Michael Shirley since his release from prison, but hopefully he is doing well and has been compensated in some way for his many years that he had spent wrongfully convicted in, in prison. His family appeared to stick by him and his mother in particular highlighted his hunger strikes that he held in prison. He was clearly desperate to get the authorities to look at the case again and although it took a long time for any real progress to be made, it was finally achieved. He can now live his life a free man. With the advances in DNA, there is always a possibility that Linda Cook's murder will be solved and solved with a much safer conviction this time. Michael Shirley was also lucky to have, you know, the journalists who paid a particular interest in his case and fought to get him released in the end. The family have gone through enough over the many years that have passed since Linda Cook's murder. A killer also needs to be taken off the streets and also hopefully that they will find the person that was attacking women in Portsmouth around about the same time, even if it's a separate person. Hopefully both cases will be sorted out and the people put behind bars. But anyway, thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Credits for this episode go to www.vice.com, birminghammail.co.uk, Wikipedia and Crime and Investigation Channel in the UK. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.